Didn't think I was going to make this film. The story of the KTM 450 EXC continues. So in this film, I'm going to talk about my KTM 450 EXC, where it's at now. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how it performed on my latest trip, which was uh, trans Euro Trail uh, Spain trip. So it was about a thousand miles through the north of Spain up into the mountains. So the viewers at home are going to see if we can run Greg Villalobos off the side of a mountain. But... <laughs> Um, I'm going to kind of tell you what uh, worked well on the bike, uh, I'm going to tell you what is broken on the bike, um, and really this is the next chapter, there was a previous chapter to this, um, the story of this bike, um, I have another film um, which charts uh, the origins of this bike, of like why I got it and when I got it, um, and its journey from a kind of hardcore dedicated um, enduro race bike through to an adventure bike, um, which I did some kind of quite big miles on. Um, and at the end of that film, uh, I had bought my PR7 and I was wondering about selling the KTM 450. Uh, and loads of people left comments saying, don't do it, don't do it. Um, I just watched the end of it and I think I was talking about getting an electric bike. Anyway, quick update. I sold the PR7, didn't really want to sell it, but needed to raise some cash for something. So the PR7 went, the 450 is the only bike in my garage, and it's now getting a lot more use. And I just used it um, for our trip from uh, southern, southern England to the north of, north of Spain on a ferry, and then riding all the way across to the mountains and the Pyrenees. It was about a thousand miles in all. Um, there is a film of that trip uh, called Memory Maker, unless I've changed the name of it in the time that I've made this film. Um, go watch it, it was quite good fun. I'm quite proud of that film. Okay, we're at Las Bardenas, which is that is like a giant rock formation thing. And there's loads of kind of, well, it's like being in a spaghetti western. In fact, they did shoot the spaghetti westerns here. And every day he had a rhythm. You get up, you ride, you stop for coffee, you ride, you stop for lunch, you ride, you might have another coffee on the trail, and eventually at about five or six o'clock, you start to get tired and hungry and hangry. And so the phones come out and you find out where the nearest village is and you cross your fingers and you head in that direction. Um, and you can see how this bike performed. It was there alongside um, a CRF 250 rally, a CRF 300 rally, uh, a BMW G310GS, uh, an old 690 and a new 690, and then my KTM 450EXC. Mine was the oldest bike by some uh, margin. Uh, my bike is now almost 10 years old. It has, um, well, right now in the garage, it's got about 16 and a half thousand miles on it, about 560 hours. So, rewind a little bit. Um, this bike, was on its route to becoming a bit of a kind of hipster bike. Um, it, I was, uh, last year I was kind of taking it from uh, enduro race bike through to an adventure bike, and now I was kind of making it a bit of a pretty photo bike. So in this photo, I've got um, the Elba um, headlight on it and a kind of a vintage motocross front end on it. And I'm kind of starting to play around with uh, not not really how it performs, but really how it looks in a photo. Um, and I was kind of like happy with that. Um, but then when I sold the PR7, I was like, right, okay, let's 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 breathe a bit more life into this bike and see where we can take it. Um, it was going to be, well, it is my only bike for everything: road riding, trail riding, adventure riding. It's all going to be done on this bike until I get another one. Um, and I'm pretty skint, so that's not going to happen anytime soon. So I guess the most significant change is the headlight. Um, uh, so I kind of, uh, I'd had my eye on these uh, big round circular kind of Baja style headlights for a while. They're not really very popular here in the UK, but I've seen more and more people using them over in the States on Instagram and stuff. And I did a bit of research. I found um, 
that I think they used to originally be made by maybe Trail Tech, I might be wrong, but essentially there's a company now called Cyclops ADV um, uh, who make uh, adventure lighting, adventure motorcycle lighting, uh, and they make this particular unit. It's big, it's chunky, it's got this big kind of metal ring around the edge of it. Um, it's got a big knob that you can turn to kind of angle it up and down. And really, it just looks like the biz. Um, in terms of what you get for light, for weight and all the rest of it, it's complete overkill. Uh, a, a little couple of little um, LED lights will do what this does uh, for a much smaller package. But I wasn't really buying it for the light that it was throwing out. I was buying it for the way that it looked and the, um, it really transformed the bike. Um, and I guess I was kind of trying to get that. Um, I think I'm trying to get like a classic look, something that looks classic, something that a lot of builders are kind of trying to achieve through their build, something that looks like it's got heritage and history, but in a modern machine. Um, and I know my KTM is 10 years old now, but you could buy a new KTM and a new 450 EXE or 500 or whatever. And do all of this on a brand new bike. I would love to do that. <laughs> um, uh, and there's a, there's a film, or, or there was a project from a, a you know, very well-known bike builder um, uh, called uh, Roland Sands in America. And he did a, um, a Kurt Caselli 450. Kurt Caselli was a racer who passed away and they built a 450. They took a, a modern 450 and turned it into a vintage 450. And it just looks awesome. Um, and he didn't have to do a huge amount to convert that bike, but it was still beyond my ability. Like, I can't make a tank and I can't kind of weld new subframes on and all that kind of stuff. But the principle there was um, a, a modern, amazingly um, capable performance bike that looked like it was 40 years old. Um, and I guess I'm trying to kind of take the essence of that and, and do it with my bike. So. The Cyclops ADV um, rally light is it. It's, it comes in kind of one unit. You've got different bulbs you can put in. Um, mine's not the standard. There's a standard one, a better one, and an off the scale kind of you know light up, you know the moon one. And it's not that one because that one's very expensive. It's like the the middle one, um, and. Uh, it literally just clamps on. You take your old unit off, and it's just got these. Um, it clamps onto your um, uh, onto your forks um, with uh, some. Oh, what do you call them? Um, like hose clips, um, and it's pretty robust and sturdy. And plug into your existing system. I think I needed to get an adapter that came with it, um, and away you go. Um, it's very bright. Uh, I'm. Uh, it's not overly bright. It's not too bright. Um, but it is much better, significantly better than the stock like orange candle that the bike comes with. Um, so yeah, so as you, I could put this photo in because it kind of, it really kind of highlights the silhouette. It changes the front of the bike, um, and you can see also that I've been playing around with the um, Adventure Spec mini fairing and seeing how that mini fairing looks because I've seen this light uh, put on these bikes without. Um, uh, any kind of fairing on, on top of it and it look, makes it look kind of a bit top heavy it kind of just doesn't quite look right so I quite like putting this little screen on on the front and it was very easy to do that with the Adventure Spec mini fairing I just had to kind of bend a few little bits um, but yeah so it, it really finishes the, the look of the front of the bike and then I'm kind of like experimenting with different screens so there's a white one this one is me putting um a translucent -y black one on and having a less aggressive style so more curves so the way I made that was I made a little jig out of wood I've got like a bit of a woodworking background and then you use a, the jig to with a router and you kind of create multiple kind of so it's a template and you can make multiple versions of that same shape using different plastics super easy super cheap to do um, if you kind of know what you're doing um, so that was all done at the end of last year. No, whenever I sold, it was the start of this year, I can't remember. Um, but whenever I sold the PR7, I had a bit more time to kind of give the 450 a bit more love. And then it was time to start prepping for the um, Spain trip. Um, so this trip had been on the cards for three years now. We were meant to go just before COVID-1 kicked in. And when COVID-1 kicked in, 
I guess, three years ago. Is it that long, really? Um, and we were all in lockdown. We couldn't travel. Um, so everything got put on hold. But we managed to change our um, ferry tickets and all the rest of it. And so it happened about a month ago. What we in? No, maybe yeah, a bit longer. A month ago or so. Um, springtime uh, in 2022. Um, so in prep for that, um, what did I need to do to the bike? So the bike at that point had about just over 500 hours, um, about coming on 15 and a half thousand kilometers, 16,000 kilometers, whatever that is, 20 uh, miles, sorry. So 22, 20, 23,000 kilometers on it. If for, for you know, for a, a, a big adventure bike, that's no big deal. But for an enduro bike, that's actually starting to get quite big miles. Um, it had a new piston at 200 hours, but other than that, it would mechanically hadn't really been touched. Um, the engine that is obviously I've done bits to suspension, all the rest of it. So my anxiety levels before this trip for whether or not the bike would make it, you know, it's 10 years old or near enough. Uh, definitely the oldest bike on the trip. Um, yeah, my anxiety levels were relatively high. <laughs> would it make it? But having said that, it's been a very, very touch wood, reliable bike. It's never let me down. Um, it's starting to get a little hard to, or was starting to get a little hard to start. Um, but other than that, it was fine. So in what did I do to prep it? So wheel bearings. Actually, the wheel bearings I took out were not too bad. These are the um, Talon hubs um, with XL rims with the crush bearing. Oh my God, they were so hard to get out uh, because I didn't really know what I was doing. Um, and you know, when you kind of go into the garage and you think it's going to be like a 20 minute job and two days later, you're still, you know, trying to sort the thing out. Um, in the end, I had to actually email uh, or phone Talon to kind of say, how on earth do you get this thing out? And, and they gave me some kind of good tips, which worked. It was hard. Uh, I kind of didn't even need to do it because the bearings were okay, which means, I mean, compared to like your standard bearings and your standard wheels, which actually don't last that long, these bearings have lasted ages and, you know, thousands and thousands of miles. So, um, yeah, um, anyway, changed those eventually. That was painful. Um, what else? Um, I noticed that the... Um, front sprocket had a little kind of you know you get like that little jackson pollock painting oil spread that kind of goes around it spreads out so i was like oh, okay something's going on there so i figured there was a little leak coming from the counter shaft so i got a new seal kit um and i replaced that um other than that i didn't do a huge amount um tires i had the motors extreme hybrid on the rear which i love i've ridden that rear tire for a long time on this bike I normally just put the extreme hybrid on the front as well. Now the front is quite aggressive. The front is to the point where we, when you're wheeling it around the garage, it's like dum, 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 like that. Um, so uh, I put this time the Motors Rousey front. So it's a Rousey front and an extreme hybrid rear. Um, and I flipping love that combo. It's so good on the road um, and absolutely great on everything off-road apart from really sloppy mud and we were going to be riding in um, springtime in in um, Spain so I was pretty sure we weren't be going through a huge amount of mud um, for me it's just an incredible incredible balance between really really great road manners and what you need for off-road and trails and hard pack stuff I can't recommend it highly enough um, yeah Razi front extreme hybrid rear and the, you get a lot of miles out of that rear as well. Um, it's amazing how long it lasts. Anyway, um, that was on what I had on the rear. Um, what else? Uh, so I did wheel bearings, the brake pads are changed. Oh yeah, I did the um, steering head bearings. So, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I did that. Um, it's a job that I've kind of put off because I've not been confident doing, um, but you watch YouTube a bit and eventually you can just figure out it's actually not that hard. I thought you needed special tools and stuff, but you don't. You can kind of reuse your old bearings to do what they need to do. Um, so I, it's, that bike had had 500 hours, 15,000 miles. It never had the steering head bearings done. Um, they were in a right shocking state when I got them off. Put the new ones on and it was like having a new bike. All of a sudden, that kind of front end, um, I was so 
had such a lack of confidence in the front end it was kind of diving in under me whenever I was turning and I thought it was normal and once I'd changed the front um the the steering head bearings it I mean it's still quite an aggressive um angle uh when you're turning but it was so much smoother like there was no rattle going back and forth so I tested it a lot there was no wobble so that's why I hadn't really changed it um but yeah now that I've changed it it's look I'm not gonna lie it's not a, a total smooth like road bike experience it's still an aggressive enduro bike but it's it's infinitely easier uh, or more comfortable and more confidence inspiring turning in now so yeah if you haven't done your front steering head bearings not you got rear ones if you haven't done your steering head bearings for a while definitely definitely go do those that was pretty much it um new fresh air filter um did an oil change before I went. Normally on this bike, I do kind of an oil change every 30 hours. Um, or if I'm on a trip, I'll change it before the trip and after the trip. Um, yeah, so that was fine. I've got um, another film. Uh, well, there's, if you haven't watched the film, go watch the film. There is also another film all about the luggage and the camping kit that I took. Um, in a nutshell, you don't need to take as much as you think, um, but go have a look if you're interested in that. <laughs> So in front of me is the core essence of what I took. Um, I've also had a, a rucksack on and I'll show you that in a minute. This is the bike um, fully set up before I went um, with a red screen. So I was basically messing around trying to figure out kind of what screen to take. It, my, one of my motivations for, for my, my bikes is because I am the media guy, it's very much about what the bike looks like as much as how it performs. Um, so yeah, so there was the red, red front screen and then what I referred to as the punk the punk front front screen which is the um, adventure spec sticker and a load of shoot and ride and sideburn mag stickers all over the place and this is the one that i opted to take just to liven things up a little bit definitely i mean my the thing with this bike it's such like a frankenstein bike is you park it up and anyone that kind of knows bikes they they're like what bike is that what is it um because it just doesn't really look like any any bike that you would recognize now there's a huge amount that didn't go into the film because there was just kind of too much there. Uh, I had like six hours worth of footage to edit and we, I got it down to 20 minutes. But um, yeah, I'm pretty happy with that film. If you like it, leave a comment. If you don't like it, don't leave a comment. No, you can leave a comment. I don't mind. Um, uh, this photo, so we, Will, um, who was on the trip with us, had a... Um, uh, uh, yeah, he, he's a very, very accomplished photographer. It was really nice to have some photos of me riding because um, it's normally me taking the photos. Uh, he did a great job of me looking quite epic in this photo, um, coming up this kind of rocky track. And this is the thing with this bike. I mean, I think he's got the same photo of all the other bikes doing pretty much the same thing. But here's what I'm going to say is with the, on these, this kind of terrain, with that bike, with the 450, it's, you just twist the throttle, front end comes up. You can be popping over stuff. It's it's so much fun. It's loads of fun. On the right terrain, you're like, I'm so glad I'm on this bike. It's like a BMX with a, an engine strapped to it. Um, in the right conditions, it's flying. It's 100% perfect. I absolutely love it. Um, so this is riding through some of the kind of the planes at the start. Um, I think the bike's a bit Marmite. Um, you probably love it or hate it. For me, I, I love it. I love that it looks so different and that you can get quite creative with your bike. Like, I'm no bike shed kind of bike builder. You know, everything on here is pretty much just, like, bought and bolted on. Um, I'm not fabricating anything, but I can still make my bike my own, which is something that I really enjoy. Like, it's no one else has got a bike that looks like this, uh, I don't think. Um this was up on the mountains at the top, um, nice and muddy. This was at the very end of the trip. Um, I really wanted to keep all that mud for like the journey home to photograph here, and it rained on the last day, and I was so, so annoyed that it was washing all of my Spanish Pyrenees mud off, and I was going to have a clean bike by the time I got home. Um, anyway, I digress. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so what went wrong with the bike? Um, there were a few things that went wrong with the bike. <laughs> it was not without its uh, issues. So the first thing, kind of halfway through the trip, the side stand um, snapped off. So I've got a Trailtech side stand. Now, annoyingly, I don't, 
I think I'd, I'd had the book. I'd had the bolt out before the trip. I think I'd had it out. Yeah, I'd taken the bolt out to put a thread lock on before the trip. And when I took it off, I noticed the, the bolt was slightly bent. And basically the, there's a bit of play down there and it's, it's wobbled and wobbled and bent the whole side stand. Um, but I didn't replace the bolt because it's a very, it's a unique bolt. You've got to buy that particular bolt. I just put it back in. Anyway, on the trip at a campsite, I literally just turned the handlebars and it, it rocked the bike ever so slightly in a particular direction and just click, snap, thing came off. So like half the trip, I couldn't put the bike on the side stand. What have you done? Uh, the good old faithful has done what they do. Oh, what a pain in the ass that is. Well, the joys of having a broken side stand. I need help at the petrol station. Is it PPP again? Oh! I didn't stop it. <laughs> Was that PPP? I can't... <laughs> Come on then, Clive, you might as well top it. Wait, 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 wait. Is it not even full? No. Sorry. Just be very gentle, very gentle. Up here, campsite, like nothing to lean my bike on. I didn't really want to just leave it on the floor all night. So uh, Adam kindly let me um, rest it up against his G310GS. Um, looks like I'm having a little cuddle. Anyway, uh, so that, that was one thing. No great drama, but a bit of a pain in the arse. Um, yeah, I think it looks great. I look, it's, it, yeah, anyway, for a lightweight adventure bike that is in that retro style and doesn't look like all the others with the kind of the rally fairings on the front. Yeah, I'm biased. It's my bike, but I love it. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, so this is, um, this is one of my favorite hacks. Uh, which I've, I think I've talked about in a previous film, but those, um, a, um, what's it, um, double tape mirrors. You need somewhere to put your can of Coke, really, really handy, or a cup of coffee or whatever. They make the perfect drink holder. You just lay it, unscrew it, lay it down flat. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so Adam, Adam taught me that. Um, yeah, kudos to Adam. I won't say what else you taught me about having the mirror like that, but you know, let people use their imagination. So yeah, so I would love to say that uh, that was the only issue. Did thousand miles, got home, no drama, bike was brilliant, you know, woo uh, But it didn't. Um, on the kind of second to last day, uh, I noticed that the clutch was, uh, there was something up with the clutch. Basically, I would pull the clutch in to change gears when I let go, it wasn't returning all the way back out to its position. Basically, it was starting to move closer and closer and closer to the handlebars. What's the, what's the barrier? Well, I've just, it just does the clutch yesterday. Something started to feel different. Still got pressure, but it just felt like not as much as before. It's not slipping. It just feels like it's not disengaging um, that well. So, not that there's a huge amount that can be done about it now, because it's <laughs> Easter Sunday. Um, and it got to a point uh, on, on the almost on the last day where when I let go of the, the clutch, it just stayed where it was uh, and I couldn't change gear. Um, and I was like, we're on, we're probably about half an hour from the last hotel. So that was a bit sketchy trying to make it to the last hotel. I wasn't really sure what was going to happen there. Um, and eventually we got there um, and it was like, oh, what on earth is going on with this? And what had happened, it, it, it started going and then you would ride in the day and it would come back. Um, and then towards the end of the day, it would go again. And it was almost like the, the oil, the hydraulic oil was, um, 
well, I thought it was boiling and losing its vis viscosity or whatever. So I was wondering if the bike was overheating for some reason, because there was definitely still oil in there, because I had a look and it wasn't like the, um, the master cylinder was empty. Um, there was definitely still oil in there, but it wasn't performing as it should. Um, so we got to the last hotel um, and it was a bit stressful going online, trying to figure out what to do. It is 6.30 in the morning on, 6.20 on Tuesday, Mon no, Monday, Tuesday. And it is the day to go home on the ferry. Um, ferry's at like two o'clock, so we're about two and a half hours away. Uh, and the reason why I'm up so early <laughs> is, um, so basically my clutch is not working properly and we suspect it's because my bike is running hot and it's basically cooked, cooked the clutch fluid. So I took the cap off yesterday and had a look and it's black gunk and I'm not when I pull the clutch lever in, it's not fully disengaging the clutch plates. So it's getting harder and harder to change gear. So, Adam's suggesting what he's calling crash boxing, which is just changing gear without the clutch, which I've not done before, uh, which apparently is quite odd. Most people have. <laughs> uh, anyway, we've got a chunk of motorway miles. It's about 130 miles. I, you know, the bike runs as long as you can get it in gear. Um, I'm trying, well, I didn't sleep much, but it's going to be a real tight one if I've got to get a van to pick me up and get me to the ferry. That's kind of why we're up so early, just to give us some options. Nothing like a, a sailing deadline to focus the mind. And it turns out, right, so I learned to ride a motorbike in my early 20s. I'm not a racer. I've not had, um, no one's taught me. I, I rode, I learned to ride a motorbike the way you were taught to ride a motorbike using your clutch and i've never done clutchless gear changes um and so adam uh, and um some of the guys were like well, what are you f messing on about just just don't use your clutch and i was like well, i'll break break the bike what are you talking about and they're like no, don't be daft and so it turns out so the next day getting going's a little tricky if you haven't got a clutch someone needs to kind of push you you know, you leave it yeah, I would have it in neutral, engine on neutral, and someone would push me. And then when I got going, I would bang it into gear. But after literally five minutes of practice, you don't need a clutch. You, you would probably need one if you were like doing trail riding, like up and down trails where you're feathering a clutch. But if you're on the road and you're just going up the gears and down the gears fairly steady away, you don't need a clutch. <laughs> So I did 150 miles. In fact, l the next day the clutch did come back again, um, but I started kind of the first 50 miles clutchless. So basically you're just riding along and if you want to go up a gear, you just put your foot under your um, lever uh, and you put a little bit of um, tension there and you just roll off the throttle and back on and it just up it goes same going down um, and once you kind of get the knack of it it's so smooth like what have i been doing for all this time the last 20 years of my life like riding with a clutch when i didn't need to anyway we got back we made it we got to the ferry um I, i'm really glad that at the point where it was all going wrong i didn't disassemble it and try and f basically all i'd done was i'd taken the um the cap off the master reservoir and i'd seen that it was like pretty black the um the fluid in there so i just put it back on so I was like, i'd rather not mess around with it here and just see what i can do to get home got back to ferry we got home um davy had a van in the south so we put in the van rode home so this is the post like these photos the bike was meant to be covered in spanish mud but it bloom and rained on the way back so you know the bike's looking far cleaner than i wanted it to but here's this here in the studio getting some photos um at the end so let's roll through things to note um so i've got 
the luggage setup on there is a Krieger OS base with the OS 12s on the side um, and uh, a giant loop rogue dry bag and then the OS 6 attached to that. I've got um, the giant loop um, Diablo Pro tank bag up front. Now I've done another film uh, about and it goes through everything that I took on the trip in those bags. So everything on there, I mean, I'm quite into lightweight um, adventure motorcycling. Everything, that's everything that I took. I had a rucksack as well, but pretty much everything that I took is in there. All my camping gear, all my sleeping gear, all my cook gear, all my clothing. Go watch the film if you want to find out about exactly what that stuff was in a bit more detail. Um, I mean, just look at the bike though. The silhouette of that bike from the side, I'm, I don't know. I think everyone loves their bike. Um, I'm very, very attached to this bike and the where it's at right now is just perfect. <laughs> you can see uh, it's on the, the jack um, stand, whatever, rather than the side stand because at this point, it, yeah, the side stand was still broken. Um, I'd, oh, I'd repacked the exhaust before I left, made zero difference, didn't make it any quieter, but I did it anyway. Um, so uh yeah let's roll through here so yeah so that's the uh exhaust and the i've got um an acherbis a cerbis um exhaust guard thing but actually the way that my luggage works it doesn't touch the exhaust so you probably don't even need that um ha uh note the blue fuel uh on one of the last fuel stations we went to uh the petrol that came out of the machine was pure bright blue I don't know, it's got some additive in it or something. But because my tank was so see-through, it was very, very obvious that, like, what is going on with this petrol. Um, uh, yeah, so that's the Giant Loop Pro uh, tank bag. Um, so, yeah, so <laughs> uh, these are uh, Cyclops uh, handguards. And I put um, my kids, my daughter's names on each side um, just as a little reminder when I'm riding to just not be a dick, basically, you know. That's what's important, get home. So this is the Cyclops um, light and the way that I had the um, fairing set up. So you can see I've got the AdventureSpec um, Adventure mini fairing mount on my handlebars and then I've made my own screen. Um, I did actually have a little bracket attaching the screen to the light, um, the base of the light, uh, but that snapped. So I just used a little cable tie, worked just as well. Uh, so this is, uh, I, I only noticed my fan going on once on the trip um, and I was concerned that maybe the fan wasn't working and then the bike was overheating and that was why the clutch was messing around and it was boiling the fluid. So I ordered a new, um, well I tested it actually by shorting it um, and the fan was working. So uh, I then ordered a new thermostat switch and just swapped this one out. It, I don't know actually if this one had failed or not, but at least now post trip, it's got a, a new thermostat switch in. Um, again, uh, the water pump, I was like, oh, maybe the water pump's not working. Um, so I did actually order a, a service kit for that. Um, but as you'll see in a minute, um, I didn't actually end up using that service kit. The bike's got a kickstart, which makes it infinitely fucking cooler than any bike that doesn't have a kickstart. Um, the new uh, EXCs uh, don't come with a kickstart. I hate using this kickstart. It is so hard to use to get top dead center and then get it going. I absolutely hate it. Um, I only ever, and I'm short as well, so I've got to lean the bike against something to stand up. I can't do it with one foot on the ground. But that aside, I love it. And it, you know, if you get a flat battery or whatever, it's actually really reassuring knowing that it's not the end of the day and you can get the bike going. Kickstarts are cool. Um, suspension is pretty stock apart from having that spacer put in to lower the bike a little bit um, you know fancy suspension on the way that I ride would be probably pretty wasted um, I've set up the sag on this bike but a long time ago I could probably do it again um, with all my gear on um, but again I'm not riding hard uh, I would love fancy suspension uh, and to see what difference it actually makes but yeah not enough to invest into it right now um, pivot pegs take a bit of getting used to um, i'm still not convinced actually i think i would happily put some standard pegs back on um, they're incredibly well made like these pivot pegs are 
eight years old, whatever, and they've had loads of use and they still look virtually new. It's like no corrosion on them or anything. So yeah, they're in good nick. Um, that's the Motors Extreme Hybrid Rear. It was new when I went on, so that's got a thousand miles on it. Um, doesn't look too bad, does it? Um, that's the Rousey front. Rousey front, uh, or the Rousey in general, is a softer compound tire, so it will wear down a bit quicker. Still, not too bad. Um, brake pads were fine. Took a spare set, didn't need to use them. Um, steering head bearings, like I said, um, they'd been changed. So that spacer there is part of the lowering kit. Now, I think you can get better lowering kits where put the they um, put the spacer actually inside the fork cartridges. Um, the one that I used, I, to be honest, I wouldn't really be that confident doing it myself, I don't think. Um, this one's really straightforward. And as you can see, essentially, it puts that spacer in and just drops the frame that amount. So you're not actually messing around with your suspension. It just drops the whole bike, um, lowers it down. Um, and so you lose a little bit of ground clearance, but not a huge amount. So that's my Garmin Montana 700i. Oh, man. Brings out so many mixed emotions. It's so close to being a great um, sat nav device. I've got another film about this. Uh, I need to update it. It's it's so close. Uh, it's big. It's really durable. Um, it's got a bright screen. Um, kind of does the basics reasonably well, but it's just it's got so many kind of little glitches in it. Um, like on the tr on the trip, it started the cradle went, so it wasn't charging properly. Um, also, the road routing is terrible. I can't get the postcode searches to work. Um, oh, it, it's yeah, it's right. I, I can't. Yeah, I'll do another film about it. I I can't even kind of. It's it's it. It brings out some strong emotions. Um, cause I, it's so, like I said, it's so close. I really want it to be perfect, but it really isn't. So yeah, I'll make another film about that. Um, this is the mini fairing. Um, as you can see the event spec mini fairing, it clamps straight to your handlebars. Um, and I've installed a key. Um, so I've done kind of, um, quite big trips on the bike. So an EXC, a KTM EXC doesn't have an ignition key you just hit the button and away it goes because it's built for racing it's not really been built for road riding um, but I have installed a key which is very reassuring when you go into a petrol station or whatever um, and you know that you basically you've kind of got a similar level of security uh, as to every other bike out there um, to an extent <clears throat> yeah love it hate it I love it I think it looks great from the front um, that NHDG stands for Knowles Honda Gang. That's just another thing to uh, throw people off the scent of what the bike is. Um, yeah, front sprocket was reasonably new when I went on. Doesn't look too bad. It's got some wear, but it's not terrible. Uh, the keened eyes uh, might notice the, <laughs> the wearing on the swing arm. So that is caused from the wob wobble of my um, side stand. And yes, I know I should sort the side stand out. And yes, it's wearing down the actual metal of the um, swing arm, and that is not good. Um, yeah, am I gonna do something about it? I don't know, probably should, I don't know. If you've got a used 2012 KTM EXC swing arm for sale, let me know. Um, yeah, just a bit of a tighter shot on the, um, the wear on the sprocket. Just a little plug for some of the uh, shoot and rise stickers that are currently available if this floats your boat. Okay, so what did I do when I came back? Um, yeah, right, so we were away a thousand miles. I don't know what that was in hours. I can probably work it out, but normally I, th I think I'm changing the oil and servicing this bike probably every maybe two and a half, two and a half thousand miles, 30 hours. I don't know whatever that works out. Two, a couple of thousand miles seems sensible. Um, like the book would have you do it at 15 hours, but I did the, that for the first couple of years and then extended it out to 30 hours. And it, the bike has 
been fine. Um, and the oil, I'll tell you what, the oil on the PR7, basically I'm servicing this about the same intervals as I was doing on the PR7. Um, so I'm stretching them a little bit on the KTM and I was doing them a little bit more regularly on the um, PR7. And the oil that comes out of this is, I mean, it's not golden, but you can see that it was golden, whereas the stuff that came out of the PR7 was black as black. Standard oil change, um, no dramas there. Uh, air filter, the air filter wasn't actually terrible. I took a spare oiled air filter with me just in case, but considering the amount of dust that we were riding through, I didn't really think that the oil filter looked too bad, uh, the air filter. So changed the air filter when I came back. Um, okay, yeah. Um, the side stand was an absolute pig because uh, the bolt had snapped inside uh, and I used a, an easy out. Um, so it's a, kind of like a reverse thread tap thing um, and I thought it was going really well and I put that in and then that thing snapped and I was like, oh, when that happened it was an absolute nightmare and that set off a catalogue of disastrous events um, and in the end I took it in somewhere and he looked at it and he was like, no, I can have a go but it ain't going to work and it's going to cost you loads of money. So uh, I, I didn't really know what to do at that point but anyway he kindly explained what he would do and there's a very particular head you can get for your Dremel. I've got a Dremel and I just came back and it's been like two hours, very, very, very slowly grinding away with this Dremel. And I got it out and I re-tapped it and I helicoiled it and I ordered a new bolt. So all in all, the repair on that cost me like 15 quid. It took quite a long time, but yeah, got the side stand done sorted, thank God. Okay, so then that left the, the, the kind of the significant issue really was the the clutch so i think did i do this first i can't remember so i i wanted to check the the clutch plates because it felt like the clutch plates weren't disengaging so i took the clutch plates out um, and checked them and actually i mean they weren't brand new but they really weren't that bad at all um, and there was nothing there that i could n of note um uh, that, that needed a repair or new plates or anything like that so i put those back in uh, I probably should change them, to be honest. I mean, that's the... I've not changed... It's got whatever, 16,500 miles on it, and I haven't changed the clutch plates once. Um, so they probably are due uh, a, a new set. Um, but then the main thing was I totally disassembled the, um, uh, the master cylinder and the hose uh, and the slave. So I took the slave off, um, gave that a thorough cleaning, um, I took the mass cylinder off, the, the, the fluid that was in there was just black gunk. So I put like an airline on and blew it all out. And then I got a repair kit for the mass cylinder. And the thing with that is, um, so inside the, you've got your pin or your piston and then on the other side of the piston there's a, um, a spring. And when it came to time to take that spring out, the flipping spring was snapped. Um, so the spring is what actually pushes the lever back out. And that was snapped and that is why the lever wasn't returning out. So I think it was a combination of that being snapped and the very poor quality of the hydraulic fluid um, oil in there that had resulted in the issue that, that I was having. So anyway, that repair kit is like 30, 40 quid, something like that. Um, and uh, it's done now. Um, and when I was reverse bleeding it, compared to how it used to be where you're pushing down on the syringe and it's coming off and going everywhere um, to reverse bleed it once I'd cleaned everything out it just was like butter not butter but like it was like water you know really really easy to reverse bleed so I'm very very glad that that is done and dusted now um, and I know what I'm doing uh, should it happen again um, and then the bike is is kind of getting quite um, hard to start and I know in my heart of hearts it's because it's this it needs reshimmed and the valves are starting to get tight. I've checked the valves uh, every 30 hours and they've always been in tolerance, but on the edge of. Um, uh, but I, as, as a kind of, I wanted to change the, uh, the fuel filter, the inline, not, so the, the fuel pump filter, um, I was pretty sure needed a change. So I um, fitted a new one of those in. And the one that came out was pretty black. And I was hoping that that would fix it, um, that actually like the pressure when you're starting in the fuel pump wasn't high enough. 
uh, and it made it a little bit better but it hasn't fixed the problem so i'm pretty sure the hard starting is down to the um the valves needing reshimmed um and yeah and so i had a look at the water pump um from the outside at least and it looked okay so i'm probably not going to use that kit um quite yet so uh where are we at with the bike um it's going in for some tlc um the, I've got it booked in on later this month, the end of this month, and it's going in for a new piston, uh, uh, a new Comrade timing chain, basically what is described as an engine refresh, not a full engine rebuild, but an engine refresh. Probably also going to um, look at the leak um, on the counter shaft as well, because the, the new seal that I put in didn't really solve that. So I think there might be a little bit of wear there on a bearing. Um, yeah, so all in all, is probably about a thousand pounds worth of work to do there, which is painful to spend a thousand pounds on the bike, but it's still a lot cheaper than buying a new bike. Um, and I do love this bike, so yeah, um, thousand pounds every ten years. I think you can manage that. If if I if this if a thousand pounds gets me another ten years out of this, I'll be very very happy. Um, and yeah, I've just tidied up the front end a little bit. Um, that was quite a big screen that I had on for the trip. So I've kind of adapted that a little bit um, and put this um, kind of cafe racer style little screen on it. Actually, looking at it now makes me think of um, way back when, just before I got the PR7, I went to test ride the Fantic Caballero. Um, and I feel like I've turned my 450 into a, <laughs> into a Fantic Caballero, but one that actually is very, very capable off-road. Um, so yes, that is the story of the bike so far. Um, the next chapter of the bike is going to be um, with a, a refreshed engine. And my great hope is that when that comes back, it will start a lot better. Um, well, I'll have a lot more confidence in the components in it. Um, and it will be ready for another kind of big trip. Uh, and I can do that trip with more confidence. I know that the clutch will be sorted. Um, I think I probably need to do a bit of work on the suspension. I, well, I definitely need to um, service the front forks and I'm, I'm pretty sure that the fluid in there will be complete gunk by now. And I need to put some new fluid in. Probably change the seals on those front forks probably need to change the bearings on the um the swing arm um and the rear shock but other than that i think it's pretty good anyway um this is my only bike if i'm riding to scotland i'm on this bike um i'm going to be going down to the abr festival at the end of this month pretty sure i'll be doing it on this bike um Look, it's not the perfect bike. It's not the unicorn bike. Um, it's loud, it's vibey. Um, it's, you know, if you're on the motorway for any distance, it's not at all comfortable. Oh, and I've got a seat concept seat on it. I, damn, I forgot to put that in. Anyway, um, there's a seat concept seat which made some difference, but not a huge amount of difference. Um, yeah, it's, uh, but it is what it is. And, and I tell you what, you feel like you're riding a motorbike. You really do. Um, and if you've only got a short amount of time to get out on your bike, it is maximum grin for the shortest amount of time, if that makes sense. Um, and then if you're on it for a longer amount of time, the grin slowly turns into a grimace um, until you get onto the fun stuff and then you're grinning again. Anyway, uh, if you have stayed with me and you were that interested in the journey of my KTM 450 EXE from Enduro to Adventure Bike and you've made it this far through two long videos, amazing, thank you. Um, yeah, drop me a comment and uh, I will thank you personally. Um, but yeah, interested to see what happens in this next chapter. I don't really know where else I can take it. Um, as in the development of the bike. I think the only thing that I'm really missing is that rear end is not, I'm not very happy with. Um, and that's why I leave those, that luggage on to basically hide it. Um, if I had some fabrication skills, you could probably actually tidy that rear end up quite nicely. Um, but it's all like the air box is all molded into it and all that kind of stuff. So I think I would have to, you know, if I'm worried, if I'm 
bitching about spending a thousand pounds on sorting the engine out, which the bike actually needs to run, are definitely not ready to go and spend another thousand pounds on rear subframe fabrication and all the rest of it. Um, oh, if you know of a nicer looking tank for this bike, let me know. <laughs> I like the big adventure tank on it, but it's still quite sharp and angular and I'd love to find something that was a bit more bulbous. Anyway, thank you. See you soon.